Good evening, everyone. I'm Craig Davis with the Chicago Public Library, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event. Please silence your electronic devices and note that this program is being videotaped by CAN TV, the Chicago Access Network. Tonight, we are very happy to welcome Dr. Elliot J. Gorn, who will discuss his book titled, Let the People See the Story of Emmett Till. Dr. Gorn received his PhD from Yale University and is the Joseph A. Galliano Chair of American Urban History at Loyola University, Chicago, and the author of several books, including Dillinger's Wild, Dillinger's Wild Ride, The Year That Made America's Public Enemy Number One. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Elliot Gorn, who will discuss a seminal period of Chicago and indeed the nation and the world's history. Dr. Gorn. Thank you very much. Hey. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, I, I do want to thank uh, Craig Davis and, and, and the Chicago Public Library. And also uh, Michael O'Connor, who helped set things up, and Sandmeyer's books for, for being here. Um, let me see if that's working. It's all working. Okay, can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, I think we, we all know something of the story of Emmett Till, but it's, it's one of those stories that, if I, if I get away from there, can you still hear me? I've got a, okay, good. Uh, it's, it's a story that's sometimes more complicated, more, um, it turns in on itself in ways that we, that we don't always expect. And, and it's interesting, I'll talk about this at the end, how it's in some ways becoming more and more prominent as a story. We, we hear it more now than we might have, say, 10 years ago uh, or 20 years ago. Um, the story, um, if you look at this photo of Emmett Till on the left when he's 10 years old, and his cousin and best friend, Wheeler Parker, the taller kid on bicycles, uh, taken in about 1950, but notice it says Argo Summit. Uh, do, do any of you know where that is? It's if you drive basically west from uh, um, Midway Airport, right, till you just get to the edge of Cook County. You leave Chicago, but you're not out of Cook County yet. And it's not a suburban town. It's actually a separate small industrial town, and that's where Emmett Till spent most of his life before he and his mother moved to the south side, uh, before, before they moved uh, to, I guess, 63rd and St. Lawrence, um, he grew up in Argo. Now, that's important for a reason. Argo was no racial paradise, but the school was integrated. Actually, Emmett's mother, Mamie Till Bradley, had gone there, Mamie Till, uh, uh, Mamie Carthan back then. Um, she'd gone to the school, it was integrated. Emmett went to that school, sports teams, at least nominally, at least, and also block by block, by block, by block residentially. It was a, an integrated town. Again, no paradise, not at all. Um, also, the, um, the great, it's named Argo for the great corn processing plant. It was the wor world's largest. Well, it was a union shop. It employed black and white workers. Black workers got the worst jobs, there's no doubt about it but it was a union shop that was not a bad place to work. In other words, if you think about Emmett Till in the first 11 years of his life or so, 12 years, he was shaped by a place that's a little different than, than what he would have been shaped by here in Chicago or for that matter in Mississippi where his family was from. Um, so that's an important piece of the story, I think. And Emmett loved Argo, that's an important thing. He went back there even when he and his mother moved to Chicago to the south side. She says, Mamie Till Bradley says in her memoir that, they, um, that he would come back, every weekend he would come back to Argo uh, to stay with his friends, to stay with family. Uh, here's Emmett Till, Christmas of 1954. He's 13 years old, will turn 14 uh, just in July of 1955. And again, and again uh, uh, a photo of him. Now, Geography matters uh, in some ways in this story. Let's see if I can get this thing to work. No, that doesn't matter. Um, you see Chicago up there at the base of uh, Lake Michigan. And Mississippi, way down, all the way down south, and equally important, 
that that northwest quadrant of Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, where the river flo flows along the western edge, the Mississippi Delta is some of the richest land in America, uh, rich for growing cotton especially. Um, and this is where Emmett Till goes. His family is from there, like so many families in the Great Migration, uh, beginning in the early 20th century and really continuing well past the Second World War into the 40s, 50s, 60s, families coming up from Mississippi, Alabama, and so on, to the Great Lakes industrial uh, cities, and especially to Chicago. Uh, well, Emmett Till is going south, back to visit family down in the Delta, in the little tiny town of Money, Mississippi, in, the, in July of 1954, going to visit his uncle Moses Wright. Um, Moses Wright is a sharecropper, uh, a very, very respected man in his community, uh, 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 a, a preacher in the Church of God, uh, God in Christ. Uh, 63 years old, he's raised, over, he's raised 10 children, um, and again, very, very well-known and respected man in Mississippi, also even in Chicago. When, he, when Emmett Till comes down to, um, uh, to Mississippi, he gets on the train, his mother puts him on the train, and Moses Wright was there to greet him on the train because he was up here, uh, uh, a one of his uh, uh, congregants had passed away and he was here for the funeral. Uh, again, it's very important, he's a very, very respected man. Well, that must have gotten in here by mistake. Uh, the Supreme Court, 1954, Earl Warren in the middle, the Chief Justice. And this is important to the story. Uh, in the spring of 1954, as you know, the court decides in Brown versus the Board of Education it overturns the decision, the old Plessy versus Ferguson decision from the late 19th century, declares that separate is inherently not equal, at least so far as the schools are concerned. That segregated schools, and it's, it's, uh, the court is talking about the South here, even though the schools are well segregated in the North, uh, that segregated schools are inherently unequal. The South goes this just roils the, the, the South, this decision. This seems like the first, though it's not the first, assault, really big assault, on what, what Southerners sometimes call the Southern way of life, Jim Crow segregation, right? The old laws of segregation that, excuse me, that come into effect late 19th into the early 20th century and continue all the way into the middle of the 20th century, past the, into the 1950s and beyond. Um, and it's, t it's important to think about what those rules and laws and also customs are. It's not just segregation, it's that the schools are indeed inferior. That for African Americans, especially in places like the Delta, which is agricultural economy, um, the school term is shorter. The school teachers are not as good. Um, school is not considered as important for black students as for white students. But it's not only that, it's, it's, it's separate uh, uh, facilities on the train. It's going to the back of the bus. It's separate uh, uh, bathrooms, if there's a lavatory at all. Separate drinking fountains, usually inferior. But it goes beyond that too. Those are the institutional things, the legal things, the, the, you, that Africans and Americans being not allowed to vote. But it's also a caste system. Jim Crow is also a caste system with a million little customs and rules that are not in the law exactly, but they're part of the way the system works. That if a black man and a white man are passing each other on a sidewalk and there's not enough room, it's incumbent upon the black man to get off the sidewalk. Uh, a, a white woman and a black woman, their eyes should not meet. Uh, a, 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 a black woman is, or a black, black person is expected to look down and not meet a white person's gaze. Don't put money directly into a white hand to a white merchant. Put it on the counter so your hands don't touch. It's a system of caste, a system of, of, of enforcing, enforcing an idea of inferiority by gestures, by little gestures that are just part of everyday life. So that when the court makes that ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education, it's starting to say something really important. It's really, it's really potentially dealing a, a major blow to the Southern way of life. And especially since it's with the schools, because for Southerners, a big part of segregation has to do with gender. It has to do with black men and white women. It has to do with the old idea of Southern honor that's very, very connected to gender, the fear uh, of, of black men that white people have. That's what's at stake here. 
And as I say, the South really becomes just embroiled by this. This is the beginning of something called the Citizens Councils in the South. The Citizens Councils are the, are, are, think of them as the upscale version of the Ku Klux Klan. Not, not, uh, not uh, working class or lower class people, but doctors, lawyers, bankers, businessmen, who in town after town after town in the South, starting in the Mississippi Delta, organize these organizations that are there to pressure any African American who gets out of, quote unquote, his or her place. Uh, economic pressure, you lose your job. Economic pressure, you can't get a loan to do your farming, whatever it is. Um, the, 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 the citizens councils, beginning in 1954, beginning with Brown versus the Board of Education, spread across the South like a, like a, like a prairie fire. So Emmett Till goes to the South to visit Uncle Mose and, and his cousins, whom he's seen before, who he's seen in Chicago, who he's been to, he's been to Mississippi once or twice before. Um, and one night, after he's been there a few days, he and his cousins get in the car, it's twilight, and they go to a little, they're, they're near the little crossroads town of Money, Mississippi, named for Hernan de Soto Money. And they go to this little store, Bryant's Grocery Store, a uh, little, little place that supplies the mostly African-American clientele in the Delta. And they go in one by one to buy sweets. Meanwhile, there's checkers match going on, going on on the porch and, and some of the kids are watching. We don't know exactly what happens when Emmett Till goes in by himself and is in for less than a minute by himself. There's a woman behind the counter named Carolyn Bryant. Her sister-in-law is staying in the, in the same building with a couple with, with Carolyn's children and uh, uh, her own Juanita Bryant's, uh, uh, Juanita Milam's children. Um, Emma Till goes in. It's unclear exactly what happens, probably not much. Carolyn Bryant in subsequent time, as the weeks start to go by after, the, after these incidents, starts to build up the story, starts to add detail to the story that isn't there when she's first describing it. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, Emmett has this meeting, he buys bubble gum. His cousin Simeon Wright comes into the store, escorts him out, right? They stand on the porch for a little while, just a few more minutes watching a checkers match. Carolyn Bryant comes out of the store and Emmett Till wolf whistles at her. Now that we know did happen because Emmett Till's cousins who were there, Simeon Wright and Wheeler Parker have insisted all along, Wheeler Parker's still alive, living in Argo, uh, have insisted that that is what, what, what happened, that it was a wolf whistle. Now, Mamie Till Bradley has always said no, that she had taught Emmett to um, whistle because he had a speech impediment, he had polio as a kid, he had a stutter, and, and she's always, she always maintained that that might have been it, that he was trying to get the words out and he whistled. His cousins said no, have always said no. They've always said it was a wolf whistle. So this happens, and, it, and, and, and if, if Emmett is a little bit oblivious to what this means, his cousins and his friends who are there with him aren't. They know that this whistle is a dangerous thing in the Deep South in 1955. They, they, they dive into their car and they head back to Mose Wright's home. At one point they think they're being followed and they, 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 they leave the car and go into the cotton fields to hide, um, but it wasn't, any, it wasn't trouble. They go back to Mose Wright's home and a few days pass. Nothing seems to happen, so maybe the coast is clear. And then a few nights later on a Saturday night, really Sunday morning, about 2 a.m., Carolyn Bryant's husband, Roy Bryant, who had been down at the Gulf Coast trucking shrimp for his half-brother, J.W. Milam, the two of them, and maybe more, go to Mose Wright's house and at gunpoint kidnap uh, Emmett Till. Uh, uh, kidnap him and take him away. He's not seen alive again by his family after that. Uh, we, have a, we, we have much more idea of what happens to him now than we did even only a few years ago. He's taken away, he's brought to a barn uh, several miles away, a place called the Sheridan Plantation. He's beaten um, probably by, it's hard, we don't know exactly by whom, certainly Milam and Bryant, the two who kidnapped him. Others are involved, kin mostly, friends of the family, it's a small circle. Um, 
and he's, and, and he's never seen alive again. A few days later, his body floats up in the Tallahatchie River, weighted down with barbed wire t tied around his neck and a gin mill fan, a 75 pound industrial fan uh, tied around his neck to weight his body down. Well, the Chicago Defender leads with a headline, Nation Shocked, Vow Action in Lynching of Chicago Youth. Right there, the use of the word lynching for, for many people is controversial. The Defender, the African American press, Jet, uh, 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 the Defender, uh, the Baltimore Afro American, and so on and so on, assume this, this is a lynching. This is, like, this is like the old style, no, maybe not a crowd gathered, but this is a lynching, it's a racial murder not this exactly, where a crowd gathers, where there are 5,000 lynchings in the South, mainly in the South, also in the Midwest, if in the years from the late 19th century till the Emmett Till story, 5,000 lynchings that uh, 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 are, it's not just about the lynchings themselves, it's about the enforcement of the rules and the laws and segregation. The lynching is, the lynching is about saying, don't get out of your place. Again, that's what lynchings are about. Not just the victims themselves, but the message they send to everyone else. Or here in Waco, Texas, where a young man about Emmett Till's age, a little bit older, uh, allegedly, again, was fresh or had something to do with a white woman and is burned to death as, again, hundreds look on. And it's the lack of shame. It's the kind of, in, in the photographs, that's so striking, the people who were there no, they're not embarrassed, they're, they're doing, they think they're doing something good. That's just so striking and, 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 and appalling to us today. Um, Emmett Till's body comes out of the Tallahatchie River. Uh, the sheriff in, in uh, Tallahatchie County wants him buried right away. And um, Emmett Till's mother manages Actually, we find out, find out later with the help of Congressman William Dawson, Southside Congressman, to uh, uh, get his body out of uh, Mississippi before they're ready to, as his cousin Crosby Smith says, spill that boy in a shallow grave. They managed to bring him back to Chicago. And here's Mamie Till Bradley. I'm sorry, I use her name Bradley. That was her name at the time. She became Mamie Till Mobley, but I, I use her name from 1955. Uh, Mamie Till Bradley at the train station to greet the body of her son. And she, she insists on, even though the state of Mississippi has insisted that the casket be sealed and not open, just be buried, she insists that it be open. She wants to make sure that it's Emmett. And she prevails upon uh, uh, the Rainer Funeral Home uh, people to do that. And she looks at his body and she determines the one thing any mother or father would not ever want to have to do, yes, this is, this is Emmett. And she makes a decision. She makes a decision. She says, as the title of the book, let the people see what they did to my boy. She decides that she'll have an open coffin. There's a piece of glass over it. Um, she decides to allow, um, photographers, a photographer, to come in and photograph her son. And that photograph appears in Jet Magazine, in The Defender, and in other places in the African American press. There's a kind of, there's a very interesting belief that that photograph appears in the mainstream American press and that whites saw it as well as blacks. That's not true. It just did not appear in the mainstream press. It was in the African-American press, even the press in a certain way was segregated. Um, but it's not as if the white press was uninterested in this story. Now let me just say that for the funeral, you know, it's people, this is down at the Ko Kojic Church, the Church of God in Christ on, uh, uh, on 40th and State Street, still there uh, in Chicago. The police estimated 100,000 people came to Emmett Till's funeral. 100,000, these aren't people who know the Tills, these are people who hear the story, read about it in the paper, and are horrified, and want to pay their respects. The crowds are just amazing, and they're, they're, they're a little, as, 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 as the Defender describes them, angry, a little grim-faced, uh, horrified, shocked, uh, people fainting at the sight of, of Emmett Till. And he's buried after a week of lying 
uh, uh, in state, I, I guess is the word, um, at the Rainier Funeral Home and then at the Church of God in Christ for almost a week. He's buried down uh, at the Burr Oak Cemetery in, in Alsop. All right, so this is, uh, this is not just in the black press, in the white press too, it's a story that's getting coverage. But when it becomes a trial, it becomes just a huge story. This again is Jet Magazine, will Mississippi whitewash the Emmett Till story? And that's a real question. It, the, the, um, the scene shifts from Chicago back to Mississippi and now to the little tiny town of Sumner, one of two, ca two county seats of Tallahatchie County. It still looks like that today, the courthouse on the green uh, in Sumner, Mississippi with the Confederate monument uh, uh, still, still out there. The sheriff of Tallahatchie County talks about, uh, he's, he's, he's not very good, <laughs> not a very nice man. He, he, he implies all kinds, of, all kinds of trouble is coming. People are coming down from Chicago to stir up trouble. Everyone is searched going into the, going into the courthouse. Um, all five lawyers of, Tallahatchie, of, of Sumner, who practice in Sumner for Tallahatchie County, sign on to defend the two who kidnapped Emmett Till, Milam and Bryant. By the way, they admitted to kidnapping him. They said they let him go, but they, they had admitted to kidnapping him. Um, all five of them, they know that their careers will be very badly damaged if they get assigned to the prosecution side, if they don't volunteer. And in fact, in stores, not just in Sumner, not just in the Delta, throughout the South, um, people, people put, out, put out tip jars so that people who are, can throw their change in and contribute to the defense of the two brothers to pay the lawyers, the attorneys who are going to defend uh, uh, the brothers. People take up petitions, people send in money from various towns. And the three lawyers who are the prosecution, especially most important in the middle, Gerald Chatham, the local district attorney. Uh, he's, a not a he's a very sick man. He has hypertension, he has heart disease. He'll be dead within a year. His family really didn't want him to take this case, and he didn't have to. He certainly could have recused himself, uh, but, but he didn't. Um, that's the gin fan that was taken from around Emmett Till's neck. That's the courtroom scene. Now, here's one of the, the, one of the things that's so interesting, I think, about this trial. As I say, it's, it, it, it seems like a simple story, but it isn't a simple story. Way back, way back there, you see the judge elevated a little bit. His name was Curtis Swango from Sardis, Mississippi. Um, a local uh, jurist, everyone who was there at the trial, uh, including journalists black and white, said that, that he could not have been a more fair judge. He refused to allow the usual kind of race baiting that you get very often in a trial of this nature. He just wouldn't have it. He, wouldn't, he actually wouldn't allow Carolyn Bryan to testify finally, not to testify in front of the jury. She was allowed to speak in court, but the jury was sent out because, he said, what does what happened in her store on Wednesday, regardless of what she says, have to do with a murder that takes place days later on a Sunday? Um, no one's defending themselves or anything like that. It's a murder. Uh, or that's, what he, that's, that's the judgment he makes. And the prosecuting attorney, too, who I just showed you, um, uh, 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 Gerald Chatham. People were amazed at how eager he was for a conviction. He really cared. He cared about the law. He was not, he was not, it's not that he was against the, the Southern way of life, the rule of segregation, he wasn't, but he cared about the law. And he, according to the, according to Mamie Till Bradley, when, when, his, when his defense, when he was done with his, uh, giving his, his closing arguments, she said he could not have done better. James Hicks, who wrote for uh, uh, the Black Papers, uh, uh, agreed. He, he, he wrote words to the effect of um, um, that, he, that there had never been a more a uh, uh, ringing defense of a black man in a white courtroom. Um, so, so, you know, so a, a pretty fair judge and a pretty good prosecutor. And there at the back table, way at the back, um, in a segregated courtroom, the African-American press, uh, Simeon Booker, uh, 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 many, many, many well-known black people, black, black journalists from uh, uh, the Baltimore Afro-American, from the, the St. Louis Argus, from Jet, and so on. Um, by the time the trial's over, about a dozen. And also journalists generally, Murray Kempton from the New York Post, a very well-regarded journalist, David Halberstam 
who was then with the Tennessean, um, uh, James Kilgallen, who had been covering trials going back to the Lindbergh kidnapping in the late 20s, who he uh, ca called the dean of American courtroom uh, um, um, journalists. They're all there covering this, and it's getting more and more coverage as the trial goes on. It takes place over the course of a week in September, the third week of September, 1955. There's Clarence Strider, the sheriff, giving a subpoena, a subpoena to Mamie Till Bradley. Exactly why is unclear, she's already there. And on the left, Roy Bryant, the younger brother, and his half-brother, J.W. Milam, who came to Most Wright's home. And this scene that's so important, it's so iconic, where Moses Wright um, is asked to uh, identify, if he can, the men who kidnapped his nephew. And he stands up in court, and he's asked, do you recognize Roy Bryant? There he is. Do you recognize J.W. Milam? There he is. And this photograph, that uh, it's an illicit photograph in the sense that the, the, there were supposed to be no photographs taken during the trial. Um, this photograph that, that, that appears, this dramatic moment. And, and, and Murray Kempton in the Post writes of, of that half hour of testimony that he gave, Murray Kempton writes, that had to be the hardest half hour in the hardest life imaginable in America. And yet there he was identifying the kidnappers. And on Elmer Till's body, even though they had taken all of his clothes off before they threw it in the river, the ring, May 25, 1943, LT. LT is Lewis Till, his father. He has his father's ring on. He had gotten big enough to wear that. It had been sent back. He, he, had, he, had, he had died in Europe during the war, Lewis Till. It had been sent back to Mamie Till Bradley, and, and he was wearing it then. And there they are to testify uh, uh, in court. Moses Wright, Mamie Till Bradley testifies to going over the body and realizing it's her son. It's Emmett Till. That's the key to the defense. We don't know who this body is. Could be anyone. It's too far gone. It's been the river too long. That's not a body that's been in the river three days. That's a body that's been in the river 10, 12, 20 days, right? We don't know who it is. NAACP might have brought that body down here just to stir up trouble between blacks and whites in Tallahatchie County. Literally, the, um, the defense attorneys say that sort of thing. They don't mention the NAACP by name. Everyone knows what they mean. And a witness of sorts, a young farm worker named Willie Reed and gives testimony. Some of, some of the, actually, some of the African-American journal, journalists literally go out in the field to bring in witnesses who are afraid to come in. And Willie Reed comes in and he gives very, very good testimony that of what he saw on Sunday morning. He identifies the truck of Milam and Bryant and the others in the truck. He talks about seeing someone who looked like, when he finally saw a photo, Emmett Till in the truck. And he goes by when the truck is parked at this barn, and he hears whipping and screaming. He doesn't see Emmett Till. He sees J.W. Milam come out to get a drink by a pump with a gun at his side. He's, he's a witness not to the murder, but he's a witness to, to all these events that add up to, to the murder. And that's the jury. And that's what you need to know. Because no African Americans can vote in Tallahatchie County, it's almost two-thirds black county, and none are allowed to vote. And to be a juror, you have to be a voter. And that's what you need to know. Women are not allowed to be on felony juries like this. Mostly middle-aged white men, who later said in so many words after the trial was over that, no, they were not going to convict. Um, uh, 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 two fellow white men of killing a black person. They were not going to be the first ones to do that. It wasn't going to happen. In other words, the only point I'm trying to make is that the, with, with uh, the good intentions in some ways, and we'll, we'll call them good intentions, of the judge and of the prosecutor don't matter in a situation where what, what you have is what we call today institutional racism. That, that, that well, the outcome is almost guaranteed by the institutions that guarantee a white jury in this situation, that, these, that, 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 that the, the old order will be upheld. Well, they find, the, they find the defendants not guilty. It's a huge story. It is uh, um, not just national, it's international. Because of the, because of the not guilty verdict, um, the foreign press in Europe 
to a certain extent in Africa, in, in the Middle East, in, in, even in Asia, uh, talk about it. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's an enormous story during the trial. And it even continues for a few months until early in 1956. Uh, see that? The shocking story of approved killing in Mississippi. It's a story by this man, William Bradford Huey, uh, an Alabama journalist who, is, who talks about how he is all about the truth. He is a truth seeker. He does nothing but get at the truth, the facts, all about the chips fall where they may, he says. He's just going to give you the facts. And the facts, he says in this story, are that, yes, Milam and Brian killed Emmett Till. They confessed to him for 4,000 bucks. They confessed to him that they did it. And he writes that. But he also writes that the reason they did it was because, I, I don't even have the words for it exactly, the Emmett Till he describes, this 14-year-old kid who everyone had described as funny, roly-poly, fun, uh, everyone had described him that way. No, Huey describes him as almost like a black militant from, from out of the 60s or something, that he's insisting he's not taking anything from these guys. I'm as good as you are, he says. I've had white women, he says. Uh, 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 and that, that's, how, that's how Huey describes him, just recalcitrant. And that's when they beat him and shoot him. The thing about that with this, with this story is that it causes for white people, mainly, the Emmett Till story to go away. I mean, it would have been, if not forgotten, it's certainly not going to stay on the headlines, but it sort of causes the story to go away. In the South, people feel humiliated that these guys confessed when they had backed them. In the North, people, those in the North who had felt some sympathy for Emmett Till come away thinking, oh, you know, this, you know, this kid, they, they, they believe the Huey story. The Huey story, it's not exactly the final word, but it really sets the tone for the future. Meanwhile, African-American people, the Till story is not forgotten at all. It's remembered. I, I lived in Alabama for a few years. The idea of keeping Alabama white just always, you know, it's about 40% African-American back then. The Till story continues for black people. The, the photograph gets passed around. Families tell the story to their children. But beyond that, it becomes a point of organizing, partly because of the NAACP, partly independently of that. Mamie Till Bradley goes on the road. She speaks to, uh, to uh, crowds uh, um, all over the country, big crowds. Look at this. This is a rally in New York sponsored. This is in the Garmin Center in New York. And it's sponsored in part by labor unions, some of the unions that were really very, very important in organizing after the Till case, the packing house workers, uh, the auto workers, uh, garment workers, but look at the crowd. That's an, in, that's an Emmett Till rally two weeks after the jury finds them, or three weeks after the jury finds them, uh, uh, um, the defense not guilty, and, and rallying about justice for Emmett Till, and more than justice for Emmett Till, about the Southern way of life, and what's to be done, and anti-lynching laws, and voting rights, and all of those things that have been on the agenda for a long time, the Till story becomes a focus for trying to change some things. And Rosa Parks says, just, just before the, uh, the William Bradford Huey article appears, when she's, when she is going to, um, uh, when she's told to go to the back of the bus, and she says later, what were you thinking about? People ask me, she says, well, I was thinking about Emmett Till. She had gone to a lecture in Montgomery a day or two before by Dr. T.R.M. Howard, where he talked about the Till case. And she says she was thinking about, about Emmett Till. And John Lewis, Congressman Lewis, writes in our Congressman Lewis today from Georgia, from Atlanta. He writes in his um, memoir that the Till, for him, the Till story was really galvanizing. He was just about the same age, he, he writes. And, and this story just, 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 it angered him and it galvanized him. And, and this was a kind of no more moment for him. And Ann Moody, too, if you ever read Coming of Age in Mississippi, the way she talks about the Till story and how it's sort of hushed, hushed and covered up. And, and she, when she finally understands what happened, this is kind of, this is kind of a beginning for her. Of, con of, of awareness. And even Muhammad Ali, in The Greatest, his memoir, talks about growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, talks about how, again, he was close to the same age as Till, how important this was. 
the activist Lois, Joyce Lardner talks about, she calls it the Emmett Till generation. And again, many of those who come of age in the mid 50s to late 50s and in, then into the 60s who joined the movement, the Emmett Till story was really critical to them. Some have said that even the courtroom scene in To Kill a Mockingbird, the, the film version, is, is, is to look a little bit like the scene in Sumner, that that's kind of the prototype. But even in our own day, if you go to the uh, New York Times and, 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 and in the search engine, type in in quotes Emmett Till, um, you'll get a total of about, as I remember, 600 stories uh, that over the, over the years since 1955 about Emmett Till. That's a lot of stories, if you think about it, that at least mention him. And most of them, of course, are back in 1955 and even 1956. But you get, a new, you get a new wave of them in the last 10 or really seven years or so. Something like, it's not a third of them, it's, 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 you know, it's, more than, it's more than a quarter and less than a third, as I remember, of the stories are very recent. The Till story, in some sense, it never, again, it never really goes away for African Americans, but for white people, it starts to come back. That photo that I said white people never saw in the mainstream press, it finally, first it appears actually in 1985 in Chicago, a local reporter named Rich Samuels does a story uh, about the Emmett Till story. It gets picked up by the Today Show and then in 1987, uh, Blackside, the uh, uh, film company, makes eyes on the prize. And they begin, their beginning of the, till, of the, of the civil rights movement for them is the Till story. Now before that, the Till story was almost, almost di didn't exist in, in telling history. Um, uh, a, a, histo a historian, Clonora Hudson Weems, talks about how when she was a kid, she couldn't get away from the stories. Her parents were just so good. And then she goes to graduate school in the early 80s, and it's not in any of the books. It's, it's, it's just not there. Or if you think about, uh, uh, when we teach the history of the civil rights, one of the books, the earliest books that got used a lot, Harvard Sitkoff's book, um, uh, the struggle, I think it's called Struggle for Black Equality, has one line about Emmett Till. The story sort of goes away and then it comes back. And we see it in our own day with memes on the, on the web, computer, uh, computer memes, uh, Trayvon Martin and Emmett Till arm in arm, or Michael Brown and Emmett Till together, many of these, as the, as, as the Black Lives Matter movement has gained strength, as the police shootings have, have taken place, more and more of these. And just two years ago, when someone painted an ethnic slur or the N-word on LeBron James on the gate in front of his home in Los Angeles, he, he says, the first thing I thought of was maybe Till Bradley. He calls a press conference the next day. I had to talk about it. I couldn't be silent. I had to talk about Emmett Till. I had to talk about what they did to my yard. These things are fused in his mind. Or when she goes to Oprah Winfrey, who was good enough to do a lot of funding of the new um, museum on the mall, the African American Museum on the Mall in Washington, D.C., there's an Emmett Till memorial in the, in the, uh, in the museum. They manage, it's a long story, but they, they, they have the actual coffin that Emma Till's body lay in for 50 years from the Burr Oak Cemetery. And there's a, there's a real decision there for the curators and, and the director, is this too macabre? Do we, can we put this out there? And they built like a chapel. This casket is there in front, the coffin, and behind it is a photo mural of the Church of God in Christ at Emmett Till's funeral from 1955. It's like stepping into 1955. People call that, call that memorial, many have said it's the most profound thing, the most moving thing in the museum. They call it sacred. And even, even, even Dave Chappelle and his comedy, uh, uh, at the end of 2017, his comedy special ends talking about the Emmett Till murder. It's come back into the culture in, in, in such profound ways. And even in Mississippi, if you go to Sumner, if you go to the courthouse, there is at least a marker, a, a commemoration. And if you go to Bryant's Grocery Store in Money, Mississippi, the same. Um, also, uh, where Emmett Till's body was taken from the Tallahatchie River, the county has had to replace these signs a few times. They get shot up, they put, them, they put them back out. The county did issue an apology to the Till family. There's also, so ironically, Clarence Strider, the sheriff who testified basically for the defense, not for the prosecution, 
Well, I don't know how old that body, oh, you can't tell, that body could have been any, couldn't have been Emmett Till, I'm sure of that, he says. Um, if you go Highway 49 that runs right by, right through the Delta, there's a few miles out of the Emmett Till Highway, and they join the Clarence Strider Highway. One of those crazy ironies of, of, um, of heritage. And that's Brian's grocery store today. A way to think about this story. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. Yes. So I, I, I've got another question. No, I don't understand that the funeral services, the, the cemetery, were, were so you know, I, I, that's, you're asking a good question. And, and, and no, I mean, I, I can, no, there are cemeteries where he, I guess, could have been buried. I'm not sure if there was a family plot there. I don't know why, why Mamie Till Bradley decided, made that decision to go down there. She's buried down there too today. Um, Four months, really. Right. Yes, that's an important part of it, but it, it also, it, it's easy to miss, for example, um, uh, just to give you an example, Simeon Booker, who, uh, uh, the, uh, the African-American journalist, writes about going south for the first time in his life in 1954 um, because there's an organizing, something, some organizing going on. The town of Mound Bayou, which is not far from where all of this takes place, it's an African-American town, it's an all-black town, uh, uh, fortified, armed. Again, I mentioned Dr. Theodore Roosevelt, TRM, what's the M? I can't remember, Howard. Um, he's a medical doctor, he has a small insurance business. Um, he's, he, in, he organizes in 1954, and he'd done this for a few years running, it just kept getting bigger and bigger, having people come to Mount Bayou, African-Americans from Mississippi, to learn about trying to register voters. 10,000 people come to Mount Bayou, 10,000. So it's, no, it's not just in the North, it's, it's happening. It's harder, it's more dangerous often. Um, you stand to lose a job, lose a farm, lose whatever, but no, no, it's, it, it, it's happening. And, and, and before the 50s too. Uh, I mean, it really is a long civil rights movement. If anyone wants a microphone, can you, I can hear you and I'll repeat what you, yes sir. It's not, it's not, it's not gossip and it is, <laughs> all right, let me, let me, it's a great question. Did she lie, Carolyn Bryant, you mean, about what? You, she does say to Tim Tyson, the historian Tim Tyson, that she's kind of vague. She says something like, that boy didn't deserve what happened to him. She's not very specific about it, but it implies that she's saying, I didn't tell the whole truth. Well, if, you're, if you go over the old documents themselves, there are notes from her, her lawyers in, at Ohio State University in the William Bradford Huey papers. She keeps changing her story. It, gets getting, it keeps getting more and more extreme until she's finally on the stand without the jury there and talks about Emmett Till grabbing her and this is a would-be rape and he said obscene things to her and so on. All right, so she, she does in some way recant that she had, whatever, she, she's, you know, whatever happened, he didn't deserve that, right? About four or five months ago, this didn't get a lot of press. It was in the Jackson Clarion Ledger by a journalist named Jerry Mitchell, a very good journalist. 
she recanted her recanting. She said, I never said that to Tim Tyson. She said, I never said anything like that to Tim Tyson. And as it turns out, Tyson wasn't recording it. He doesn't have a, a recording of her, say, of her saying that he didn't do what, what I said he did, or whatever it is she said. So it's, again, that's why I said at the beginning, this is one of those stories that's so murky, you know, that there's so many, you know, there's so many things that might be true, could be true, and you can nail some of them down, but you can't nail all of them down. Uh, you know, we know, but, but you know, we know, we know she lied. We know that for a stone fact. Not because she told us she lied, but because we have evidence that she lied, real evidence, right? And we know that Emmett Till was no, you know, uh, uh, I'm as good as you are, I've had white women. There weren't even white girls going to the school that he went to in Chicago at that point. It was a segregated school, Makash school. Um, so we know that that's crazy. But it's that kind of story, is, is all I'm saying. Yes, sir. He was, actually, he was actually executed for raping two women and murdering another. Uh, that's what the, that's what the um, court martial papers say. There's a, there's a, there was a full court martial. He and another soldier were executed together. Uh, a man named um, Murray, James Murray, I, be, I believe. Um, uh, and again, this is another complication of the story. This is another reason the Till story goes away because of the Huey article and Huey talks about this. Uh, and and this, is, this, is part of the, this is part of the smearing of Emmett Till. You know, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, blah, 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 right? Um, that information is released. Uh, military records are classified, right? That you can't just, not just anyone can get them. The southern senator from Mississippi, James Eastland, manages to procure those and leaks them to the Jackson papers. Just before a grand jury is to meet in Greenwood, to try to, to try to prosecute them for kidnapping, which was pretty, pretty easy. You know, they admitted to kidnapping. The, and the grand jury decides not to even, not to go there. But it's a real, that's a really interesting, I do have a chapter on, on Lewis Till, and it's a really interesting and difficult thing. Was he guilty? He was not a nice man. We know that. We know that Mamie Till Bradley, that he beat her she had to get a restraining order against him, and a judge gave Lewis Till the choice, army or jail, and he went into the army. So we know he's not a great, a great guy to begin with. The evidence, the, the trouble is that the evidence against him is all eyewitness testimony by accomplices. Well, the army's pretty clear that that's, that in and of itself is not great evidence, and yet it was sufficient for the court-martial to convict him and for a re review board to, uh, to uphold that. Now that's in a context of court-martials during the Second World War where African Americans are prosecuted way out of proportion to their numbers compared to white soldiers. So there's a whole context for this too, especially if it's a crime that involves sex in any way. So, you know, my, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what a conclusion I come to and it's not very satisfying that he's probably guilty and a good attorney, if it was a civil, law, a civil trial, would have gotten him off um, because the evidence wasn't great. Why do I say he's probably guilty? Because he, we know he wasn't a really nice man to begin with. We know he was a violent man. But I don't, my, opi my opinion is no better than anyone else's reading those documents. The army was pretty segregated. Oh yeah, oh the army was totally segregated, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. No, the army is totally segregated. Well, the, the, the army went a step further. To the extent that, to the extent that black troops were allowed, were allowed to fight, they had white commanding officers from the south. The army assumed that southern whites knew how to handle African Americans. That's a great combination. That's a you know that's a you know, uh, uh, so so yeah, yeah. What else? I'm here for you. Oh, yes. This is the third time I've been asked that. Okay. That's good. Um, that, that one of the ways, the story is that one of the ways of getting Emmett Till's body out of the South was the Pullman Porters 
uh, um, uh, assisted. It's possible. I, don't, I haven't seen anything that directly confirms that. I'm guessing that even more important was William Dawson, the congressman who made it, got it, reached, got, managed to reach an agreement with Mississippi, and also Crosby Smith. If, if Pullman Porter's helped, it was probably because Crosby Smith, Mamie Till Bradley's cousin, was aboard the train and said, he said, I will accompany that body back to Chicago, and, and maybe you know, elicited their help. Um, but I've never seen it directly. I've never seen, it is a story that's told. Pullman Porters are really important. You know, they were, they were really important in the kind of commerce north and south and, and you know, and, 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 you know, just delivering the, the Defender into the south where, where it's dangerous to deliver the Defender and so on. And you, Oh no! Oh God! No! I should say that. No, no one, no one, no, no. You couldn't stay in Mississippi after that. Moses Wright, his uncle, couldn't. No, no, no. He he would have loved to. He was a farmer. He loved farming, but he he immediately he as quickly as he could he sold his goods. He and his sons uh, slept in the cemetery to be safe for a few nights. Uh, and 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 uh, uh, matter of fact, he even wrote his brother Crosby Smith and said. Uh, um, I'll leave my car such and such place, sell it when you get back if you can. Uh, they all went to Chicago. Willie Reed went to Chicago. Uh, every, everyone who was involved in the trial knew that life in the South was not going to be good. Uh, so they, they, every, everyone, everyone went to Chicago. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to say that Chicago was paradise, but... Um, and, and, and actually, that, just to get back to your question, you mentioned Tom Segru a little bit. The, 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 I, it, I, I, know, I, I understand segregation in the North, and Segru is a wonderful historian. This is an inside thing. But you know, you, you also got to give credit to millions of people who leave the South, to the Chicago Defender that, for example, that, that, that knows how bad the North is and is constantly talking about it, and still is saying, get out of the South. You know, it, it's, you know it's, it's kind of, people aren't fools. That is Bryant's grocery store today. Oh. I'm sorry, I should have said, did I say that? I didn't say that? I, I didn't oh, okay, that's, that's Bryant's grocery store uh, today. I'm sorry? Barely, barely, yeah. Uh, it apparently was, some of it's just rotting away. It was abandoned, uh, the, the entire black clientele abandoned the Bryant's. Um, uh, after, this, after the trial. So they had to sell the store. It didn't do very well after that. One of the hurricanes, and I can't remember which one, that blew through, even though this is pretty far inland, did a lot of damage to it also. Um, and it's just, it's never been restored. There's occasionally talk of trying to restore it as a museum. Yeah, there's a family that owns it that refuses. As a matter of fact, there was a piece about it in the New York Times just two days, three days ago. Um, uh, there's a family that owns it, who, and they were not particularly involved in the Emmett Till case, and they apparently don't want to sell it, don't, you know. I, I, and, and that's the irony. That's why the you know, as you say, it's it's very easy to be very self-satisfied and, and feel good about ourselves, but that's what's so interesting about the Emmett Till story showing up again with Trayvon Martin, with, you know, with all of the murders that have taken place that know the story's alive. This is not just the past. Um, this, is a, this is very much alive because white supremacy is still alive. Anyone? Yes? There, in fact, the one that, uh, that strikes me was a, a black sergeant in the military just after Harry Truman had integrated the military and there was a white toilet and a black toilet and somebody was sitting on the black toilet and he says, I gotta go. And he went into the white toilet and 50 white men dragged him out of there and beat him to death. 
the, 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 Well, and it can, and it did continue to happen, though. Though, though Truman did did integrate the armed forces. Um, uh, soldiers are really important, really important and interesting in all these stories. They were very vulnerable. I mean, uh, north and south, but especially it, during the 1919 riot here in the north, and also during, you know, otherwise during the south, soldiers were very vulnerable because here were guys who, and you know, had, pro had, had misproven all of the slurs against African American men. They served their country. They were brave. They, they often they fought. They were vulnerable, and they were also often much more militant. That a lot of the leaders in the early civil rights movement, the Medgar Evers, the Amzi Moores, and so on, uh, the Aaron Hendricks, they were veterans. They had served in the Second World War, and that, that was that was a, was an important an important point. Um, but yes, there were there were murders of that kind. Uh, there there certainly were. Yes, it's hard for me to see here. I'm sorry. I've got the. I see you, sir. I'm sorry. Why what? What did Emmett Till do? He probably did whistle at her, which was which was enough, for uh, 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 you know, for, for. I mean, this is all part of the whole insane, you know, sort of notion of honor that still lingers uh, for for in the white South, of that that you know this is an insult and something should be done about it. But as many people said, well, something should be done. All right, even if this is a, even if this is a kid who didn't know what he was doing, and, and maybe you're going to you know, just beat on him a little bit or something like that. Um, we, we don't know exactly what happened. There's a recording of Roy Bryant talking, and, and, and what, it, uh, what it implies is that, yeah, they're beating him, and it just went too far, and finally bringing him to the hospital wouldn't have done any good, so they killed him. If that, is that the full story? We'll never know for sure. Uh, that comes out. The FBI reopens this case. The FBI was running from this case. They wanted no part of it in 1955, unless there were communists involved. Then J. Edgar Hoover was interested. Um, but the FBI reopened the case in 2004 through 2006. And while it's not definitive in terms of finding out who else was involved, it's, there are some things like that that are pretty clear, at least bits of evidence that are, that are that are interesting and, and, and important. Um, uh, I was able to get, it's a 10,000 10, page file. I think they sent me maybe 1,000 pages when I did a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, I would have liked to have seen the whole thing, but you know, uh, some really interesting, interesting stuff. Um, a, a long time. I mean, it, uh, yeah, I, I, I really can. Uh, I, you know, I was thinking about what the next project was, and I was talking to then a colleague of mine, uh, Francoise Hamlin, who wrote a book on um, uh, uh, Green, Greenville, Mississippi, uh, during the '60s, and we were just talking about it. And she, she was dubious, and I was, you know, I was just thinking about, I, you know, I was sort of thinking that, you know, I, I had written about boxing, I had written about the labor organizer, Mother Jones, I'd written, you know, I just sort of, I'm kind of a gadfly as a historian. And I hadn't really written about coming closer to my own time, and I hadn't really written about, about white supremacy and race and, and, and all of that. Um, and the Till story at that time, this was in 2009, um, seemed um, undertold. It hadn't, it, it was just sort of, it was starting to, you know, there was, there was this beginning idea that this is a really important story and people are talking about it. And as I wrote, it just became more and more of the case. It just seemed this, this story is really out there. Um, I mean, the comparison in some ways is to um, uh, 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 um, uh, Holocaust, uh, 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 Anne Frank, that, you know, and it's not, a, it's not exactly a similar story, nothing like that, but the idea that the death of one is a tragedy to the, the death of a million is a statistic that we sort of understand the horror through one story. So it seemed that, that this would take me there, that that's something I wanted to do. Um, so from about, I finally decided about 2010, 
that I, you know, this isn't going to let me go. I better, might as well go ahead and do it. So from then until now, I've been working on it. Uh, so a long time. Uh, what's next? I don't know. Uh, this, this is, you know, I, I, I tell people, this is true, that um, as I was thinking about this book and writing it and researching it, you know, it was, it was really a hard book to do and, and harder than others I've done. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm just getting old, you know, and I am getting old. That's probably true. Um, but it wasn't just that. This is just a hard, this was a hard story to live with. There was just so many times, you know, it was just so outrageous and so horrible that, you know, it was, it was just a hard, hard story to do. So maybe the next thing I'll do is a joke book. Uh, maybe. Anyone? I'm here for you. Is it? Oh, yes, yes. And, and again, if you were African American, that wouldn't have been true. You would have heard it many, many times growing up, probably. Um, at least, at least, given, given your age, at least for those those first years, we're the we're the same age. Um, uh, and and I don't, but I grew up. I didn't grow up in Chicago. Um, uh, I, you know, I couldn't even tell you the first time I heard about it. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm just not sure. Um, but when, when it first, when the story first, you know. Um, but yeah, no, that was perfectly possible that, that you wouldn't hear about it. It'd be hard not to hear about it today. It's, it's even smaller than it was. It's, it's a tiny, tiny, it's not even a town. You could drive through and not know there was a town there. Um, I think they restored a service station. There used to be a post office. I don't know if it's still there. It's, it's just, it's really tiny. It's, it's, um, it's, 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 if you, it's just north of uh, Greenwood, uh, maybe, what do I, I can't remember now, 10 miles, something like that. You pass one of the three grave, gravestone markings for Robert Johnson. There are three of them in Mississippi because no one really knows where he's buried. The blues man, Robert Johnson, uh, is a church, uh, the, you go by a church cemetery. Um, there's, there's just so little, there's, there's so little there. Yeah. It is, it is, it uh, does, um, th this is, this is entirely not, this is not the historian's trade to talk about, but there are three places in my life where I felt like the ground is pulling me in, you know. Money, Mississippi was one in front of that, in front of the Bryan Star. Uh, ground Zero, not too many months after the World Trade Center, and Auschwitz. Uh, uh, those, 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 th those three places, just sort of this heaviness that just, you know, maybe it's all in my mind, I don't know, you know, but, but I, I felt it in those three places. I'm sorry? Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, I, certainly there's an awakening. You know, I've studied history for a long time, and I've read a lot of history and a lot of history by, by whites, by blacks. Um, I wouldn't call it an awakening like the scales fell from my eyes. I'd been reading this sort of thing, not about Emmett Till, but this sort of thing for a long, long time. Um, it was hard because the story is so sad because sometimes it's so infuriating, the things people say, um, um, because it's so depressing and so awful. Uh, it was hard, hard for those reasons. Um, not as hard as for those who lived it, obviously. Um, 
obviously, but, but, but hard. But not, um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Am I? Am I? Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that as difficult as it was for you to write, as difficult as it was for you to make the decision to write about it, Right. When we began kindergarten, I retired my grandma myself, retired educator, and I retired in 2000. I'll just share just a little bit about me. Um, and my youngest, I've been in Chicago for 10 years. My youngest is a Harvard uh, graduate student, did a grad study at Harvard. And she's a director here at a Montessori school. And that's how I ended up here to help her and my, and, and my son in law. Children who are instead of twins came early before they could afford to pay seven hundred dollars a week for childcare. However, even with your credentials, even in two thousand when I was able to retire, also did twenty one years in the Navy. So I'm embedded in America's history and America's lifestyle. However. LWB, even in 2019, hasn't changed when I was born in 1954. It's the challenge, whether it was Emmett Till, Laquan McDonald, it hasn't changed because we deny our history. February is not Black History Month, it's America's history. Right. And so it's like saying Obamacare, if you put a negative connotation with it, it's the Affordable Health Care Act. But the way we do this, it begins for us in kindergarten. When we learn to read, see, flip, jump, Tom has a red wagon, there are never any children that look like any of us. So I completely understand white supremacy because of everything I see, everything I learned, everything that appeared to be positive and wonderful and great look just like me, I understand white supremacy as an African American. So when we talk about and wonder well, what could Emmett Till have done and did he whistle, did he not whistle, his life had no value, period. Right, and they're, they're really, you're right. Those questions really are, what's the difference? You know, yeah, you know he did, he didn't, he, you know. He, no, I, 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 I hear you. Uh, um, uh, and, and you're right, black history is American history, and the history of white supremacy is American history, uh, uh, too. I wouldn't for a minute claim to, um, you know, claim anything other than, you know, I say it was hard to write. It was nothing compared to what other people do, go through. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not claiming that. I really am not. You're right. Well, I, 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 I think it's the reason why we have to all keep telling stories, you know, and get them, and, you know, get, trying to get them right. You say stories, I say truth. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I, like we have President's Day, or we celebrate Columbus Day, or we celebrate Thanksgiving. Let's check with the Native Americans and hear about their day of mourning, which we call Thanksgiving. So let, if, we, if we begin at that, that point of education and change our system to actually have our history, I think we can begin to make a, a different United States of America. Not make America great again, <laughs> but no. a history of who we really are. And it sounds like you better start writing. You got a book in you over there. Let's make it. <laughs> <laughs> you got a book for you. Start writing. Sounds good. Yes. Yeah, this was from, uh, you know, the book. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yes, not a lot. Oh, 
even here in Chicago, down on, what is it, 73rd, I can't, 71st? Um, no, I don't, I don't. I, very, I don't have a lot of photos in the, there in the book, and it's kind of deliberate, um, because, um, because I, I, yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. There's also one in Argo, by the way, uh, where, you know, near, near where he lived in, in Argo. Um, but no, no, I don't, no. Um, the, the only, the only, let me see if I'm right. The only picture I have that sort of sort of contemporary is like that of the of the of Brian's grocery store today. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. These, these are all stories about, about a kind of innocence or, or, or a, you know, of a life cut short of, 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 all, of, the, of all of those things. Absolutely. All right. Thank you.